I'm late. I hate being late. <laughs> Pretty cool view, isn't it? Yeah, I uh, was wiping, standing up in my door in my truck, wiping the windshield off, and I went down and drove a saw file into my leg through my waders. Can you believe that? I taped them up. <laughs> Hopefully, it holds up long enough for me to catch a fish, but I got some hiking to do. Check this out. What cools up? All right, here we go. First, first day steelhead fishing, 2024. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll get one. I'm not too late, but I like first light. <laughs> I want to be in my hunting spot at first light. I want to be in my fishing spot at first light. First light to me is in the dark. And then the, oops, oh, that's when it's still dark. 
light starts to glow in the sky. That's first light. This is late. <laughs> but better than never, right? Hopefully my tape patch works out on my waders. That really sucks. I want some brand new elk poop. <clears throat> I think the water's gonna be good, meaning just the right level. I'm grabbing torrential downpours. Whatever. I never heard. Trees have blown down or washed down, that's for sure. Water's great. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Couldn't be better. And nobody's down there. It's about as good as it gets. Will there be a fish here for me today? Put this way before I fall down and lose it. Huh. No fish. Around the camera, underwater, no fish. Not even trout. Crystal clear water. But oh well. It's the way it goes with fishing. It'll be there eventually. Should be a couple there eventually. So. I'm gonna use what I got left of my battery and SD card on here and see if I can't get some some more voices knocked off here, some more knowledge shared. Um I was gonna say I gotta tell everybody pre-warn. So I had the Sony handy camera, handy camera, <laughs> Sony handy cam I put on the shelf behind the ladies, and you just see the back of their heads and me in front of them sitting across from them for that video. But luckily I put a GoPro on me on the table too, because the audio is actually better on the GoPro. And I, I can't load the SD card from the Sony camera onto anything. I tried loading it onto YouTube. I tried to load it onto both my laptops. It starts doing it and then it says it can't. Something went wrong. I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna have a nervous breakdown. So I won't be able to show you that angle, but at least I got it all on video. It's just my ugly mug in the whole thing, unfortunately, but whatever. I'll, uh, maybe I'll throw some B-roll in there, but it's some pretty good interesting conversation. One long, long enough, I think I'll do it in two parts. I'll do that when I get home. Now, who do we got? Who needs to be heard? A lot. All right, there we go. I'm sitting on some river rock. I don't know how long I'm gonna last sitting here, but. All right, here we go. This is titled The Interrupted Sasquatch Deer Hunt. Hi, Steve. This is a long one, so get some coffee. <laughs> this took place July 2013 in an area just outside of Ashford, Washington, in the foothills of Mount Rainier. We were there on a camp out with several other people. On Friday afternoon, several, several of us went on a hike walking up an old grade road, which was being overtaken by alder trees. Along this road, by about seven foot high, were twigs that were snapped all in the same direction and the same height. This road came out to a clearing, where on one side of the ravine was an old clear cut, 
There was a small creek that ran between the two hillsides. There was a fire trail that paralleled the clear cut along old growth timber, which was the side we were on. Being the hunter that my boyfriend is, he suggested that we come back up later that night to look for deer or elk. There were three of us that went back up there that evening. Myself, my boyfriend, and another man. We were all dressed in camo. Being that the fire trail was clear of brush, we were able to make our way to the top without making a lot of noise. We settled in facing the clear cut with the big timber at our back. It was about 9 p.m. There was a slight breeze coming from our left. It was still light out. Being summer in Washington, it stays lighter longer, so we could see the hillside across from us. As we were sitting, we could hear what sounded like rocks or boulders rolling in the creek below us. There were several, sorry, there were various sounds of sticks breaking. As darkness started, a large military plane flew in from our left through the canyon so low that we could have hit it with a slingshot. If this has anything to do with what was about to take place, I don't know. That was a strange coincidence. It was about 9.30 at this time. To our left, a deer, is that thing still working? Yep. Sorry, to our left, a deer came running into the clear cut, blowing as it does when it wins something, which wasn't us as we were downwind from her. By now it was so close to dark, so we were unable to see the deer, but we could hear the deer moving across the clear cut in front of us which on a straight line would be approximately 125 yards. As it was moving, it was continually blowing. Excuse me. While we were watching and listening, we could hear sticks breaking to the left and the right of us. At our 10 o'clock area was an ice blue light flash and another at our four o'clock area. Chatter was heard in the 10 to 12 o'clock area. While we were observing all this, the deer was ping-ponging back and forth across the clear cut as though it was being corralled. We figured there was four to five Sasquatch on the hillside to catch this deer. At about 10 o'clock, the other man let out a loud howl. Immediately following his, following his howl was a response from the clear cut in the four o'clock area with a loud return howl and crashing into the bush. Then about 40 yards below us along the creek, there was three loud heavy steps and coming up from the game trail about 20 yards from us was a large dark figure that seemed to be gliding, no sound, and moving very fast to our right. After this evening went quiet, sorry, after this everything went quiet in the clear cut, the deer ran off over the side of the hill. Feeling like we had messed something up, we decided that it was best we leave the area it was about 10.30. The next morning, we went back to the area in the clear cut to find where the deer had been running back and forth, along with two large footprints measuring 12 and a half inches and the other at 15 and a half inches, and leaving an impression of three and a half inches. So three and a half inches deep. Flagging ribbon was put on the trees in the area of the tracks. We went back to our vantage point where we, where we were the night before to discover these tracks were in the area of the chatter and the blue light. The following weekend, my boyfriend, my daughter, and myself went back to camp in the same area. That evening, we hiked up to our vantage point that we sat at the weekend before. Looking through our binos, as binoculars, our flagging ribbon, ribbons were no longer on the trees. We sat for maybe half an hour before, feeling like we were being watched from behind and very uneasy feeling and a very uneasy feeling, so we left the area. There's no paragraphs. <laughs> Sorry. And a little bit of punctuation missing. We'll get her. Included in this email is other, the other man's report, which was written down the evening and day after our exciting event. He has more detail into the timeline and our activity, which all comes into play. This we will never forget. We have several other encounters which will come in another email. Until then, thanks for sharing. Vic and May Neal, Tenino, Washington, Kevin Spokane. And here's Kevin's report, July 31st, 2013. Members involved, Victor, May Neal, and Kevin. Clothing, each of us in, in camo. Weather, hot day, clear skies, barely a breeze out of the west, not blowing across the canyon. Moon had been almost full but not up in the sky during this time. 
Victor's plan, watch wildlife movement before sunset. After dark, do Sasquatch calls. We'd been to the spot earlier in the afternoon and because of the terrain, we thought more time should be spent there. Lay of the land, an easy west, an, an east slash west running canyon with a basin to the west, creek in the bottom. Our observation spot is above a game trail with deer tracks that angles down to the creek. We look across at the opposite canyon hillside, approach along an old firebreak trail. The trail was free of deadfalls and brush, so allowed for quiet walking. Timeline, we arrived a little after 9 p.m. We heard a couple of small rocks rolling at our 12 o'clock position. 9.30, at our 11 o'clock, a deer started blowing over the next 10 minutes. The deer moved east to our 1 o'clock, then acted confused and began circling and going up and down, back and forth in maybe a half an acre area, blowing the entire time. The temperature was dropping and it became very dark. 10.06 p.m. it did a loud, long Sasquatch howl toward the basin and ending to our 12 o'clock. We immediately heard at our 2 o'clock heavy crashing thumps followed by a howl. I did two whoops in that direction, paused, two more whoops. Deer totally confused, moving back and forth, then it started northeast over the ridge at our 2 o'clock. May Neal did two wood knocks, paused, one more repeat, and same sequence of knocks. Deer came back towards us, to the area where it was first circling, and I did three to four whoops. Victor saw a light on the hillside at our 2 o'clock, and I did another long, loud chatter. Sorry, a long, loud howl. Chatter heard from area of small light. The chatter was short in length and fairly high pitched. Repeat of chatter, same location. May Neal did two wood knocks. Chatter now at our 12 o'clock. May Neal did two wood knocks. Deer still blowing. Made my way toward location where chatter was first heard. But went uphill and over ridge. We heard two dull wood knocks at our 12 o'clock. I did another howl to the east, and Victor heard soft crunching, walking on our side of the stream below us on a game trail. Victor and me and Neil caught a glimpse of a dark shadow to the right. No particular direction of movement to the shadow. Victor said, let's leave. Turn on red, ha red ha headlamps. Get on the firebreak trail. It was 10.30 p.m. When on the trail, I said, that was fast and furious. Victor said, what they sasquatch sorry victor said what they were doing was hunting the deer possibilities discussed at the meeting bear don't hunt that way cougar don't hunt that way wolves and coyotes they would chase the deer the deer stayed in the area for a long time acting confused the next day we crossed the creek went to the hillside directly across from our observation point at approximately 125 yards from our observation point two sasquatch tracks were found the 12 and a half inch track was in gritty, sandy, tiny chipped rock soil. It had enough impression to make the track visible, but we made no indent, but we made no indentation in the soil. The bald foot and the big toe of the 15 and a half inch track cut into the side of the mound of the soil. It measured three and a half inches deep. At that point, our assessment, we believe there were at least four Sasquatch in a coordinated deer hunt to at location of the first of the first herd chatter, they were pushing or driving the deer. Another Sasquatch low on the opposite hillside to our one to two o'clock and to fourth at our two o'clock, but further away as it turned the deer back towards us. My final thoughts throughout my years of hunting and outdoor activities, I've never heard of deer blowing for so long and not leaving the area. I've never heard a deer stay in one spot and be so confused. It seemed as if it was corralled and it could not find an escape route until my howls turned the attention of the Sasquatch toward us. I feel the Sasquatch either did not like the intensity of my howl or they thought I was another Sasquatch intruding, interrupting the deer hunt. I think they did not know we were there or they thought we had left because we were silent for about an hour before the first howl. Thanks again, Steve. End of email. There you go. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I'm definitely no expert, from, but I will say, from my point of view, from what I've learned, um, I'm pretty confident myself, although I may be wrong. But at this stage of the game, I am confident we never interrupt them trying to get a deer or an elk or anything. We just don't. 
there's far, far, far too many eyewitness accounts of these beings, A, moving faster than they've ever seen anything move, boulders the size of volleyballs being thrown over 100 feet with deadly accuracy, and these beings appearing wherever they feel like appearing when they want. So, let's just say I'm a hunter and I've got those skills. I'm going to go grab an elk or a deer any time I feel like it, and I'm going to do it all by myself. No problem. Right? Did they not know you were there? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. For all, so far from what everybody's been sharing with us, if you are going to have a face-to-face -face and surprise one, like, holy shit, it seems to be along a river. It seems to be along a creek or a river is where that tends to happen. It happened to my grandfather, right? He came up to the edge of the river. Only He was only that way about, oh, he's that way about 40 miles, 30 miles that way. Going through the timber, just like I was this morning. Slides on his ass down the bank. Boom, there's this reddish brown, reddish hair covered, reddish brown, reddish brown hair covered being squatting over the water. Didn't know he was coming. Didn't know he was there until he spun around and looked at my grandfather. So... And I don't think we've had too many people report bumping into these beings and surprising them without there being it, it being alongside water or creek bed. I'm sure it's happened, but uh, my memory only seems to register the the, uh, the side of creeks or riverbeds where people have enough surprise experience. Not being said, I'll. I'll tell you guys flat out, straight up. I park. I don't fish this river right here. I hike to another one. And I hike to the timber. And as I left my truck this morning, I said out loud, leave me alone. And there's a whole pile of sightings right here. Right here. So uh, a bunch of my native friends have all seen them right here. And I always say, I always say, leave me alone. I'm here to catch a fish and that's all I'm here to do. And that's it. And I'm telling you to leave me alone. And for the most part, it seems to be working for me so far, right? So far, I think I might have to move. I'm sitting on my one leg on the side of a river rock bank. There's no way I'm going to sit here for that long. So, who else? I had to interrupt this video to go hike into the river and try fishing one more time. <laughs> This little trail I haven't seen before. I drove up the road to go to a different spot. And I saw this massive elk trail. Uh, huh. Maybe that will take me to a good spot to fish. And so far, it's definitely taking me in the woods. Let's see what's up here. drifted down this river in a boat. I've never hiked into all the spots. It's the first time I've hiked into here. A big tree there. Man, my elk just got this. Oh, there's a nice beach here. Look at this. Wow, what a great spot. Are you kidding? Holy. Beautiful. What is that big imprint in the sand down there? Of course, the first thing you always spot, right? Let's go look together. Oops. Hold on. Losing my gear here. this? Whoa. It's got potential for fish written all over it. Elk tracks here. Elk and a weird hole dug out. Hmm. 
no human prints, just uh, elk. Well, let's get to it. See what happens here. Oh my god, I just had a freaking hammer steel head on. <clears throat> Caught hooked him right there. Oh. I was fumbling with I got another GoPro on my kneecap and I was fumbling with it. I came ripping up river. I gently pulled up on him and it spit the hook. Oh the pain. About the excitement. I hooked a steelhead. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, maybe I'll hook him again. You never know. Try this again. All right. Of course, once you hit one steelhead, you can't go home, right? <laughs> what time is 1.30 now? Whole body started to feel it from casting all day and hiking through this shit. So, we're finally gonna sit down again and finish this video up. Hi Steve, thanks for persevering, sharing your knowledge, experience, and the stories of others. I'm in my 60s, I love the outdoors, and have had two odd experiences over the years. I'd forgotten them until I started watching your channel. The first occurred west of Stony Plain, Alberta in 1981 when I was driving home to our acreage. There are lots of ponds and thick bush on either side of the road, so it was a great habitat for animals. It, I happened to look in the rear view mirror and I saw something crossing the road. Steve, I've lived in the country for many years and I've never seen anything like this. And it creeped me out big time. It was on, it was on four tall, skinny legs. And the back ones bent opposite to what they should have. Its back was hunched like a hyena, and the thing just felt sinister. Even thinking about it today, I feel uncomfortable. It was definitely not a coyote, badger, or a normal critter. And I'd forgotten all about it until I recently saw your drawings and descriptions of creatures as Skinwalker Ranch. And then it was, holy crap, that seems just like what I saw years ago. The second experience happened about seven years ago, and I was living on an acreage just east of Sylvan Lake, Alberta. I would walk in the pastures and stands of trees with my dog. It always felt like a magical place. There was a good foot of snow on the ground, and as we walked out from the bush into a clearing, there was a very odd track created in the snow that had to have been created by something round rolling across the snow. The imprint in the snow was at least six inches deep, three feet across, and sloped on both sides to give a semicircular impression. Whatever it was, rolled for several hundred feet and crossed over a couple times. There was a definite starting and ending point and no other tracks in the area. No footprints or snowmobile tracks, just this odd rolling track near the edge of the clearing. I turned around and my dog was digging in the snow by a small bush near this track. I bent down and realized she had uncovered a piece of brown and black fur. Normally when hunting, she would grab a mouse, toss it, and down the hatch it would go, but this time she was just pawing at it. I picked it up, and it was very soft and flexible, but there was no blood, bone, head, legs, or anything identifiable. Just a large soup bowl-sized piece of fur, much like a rabbit or a cat's, but there was no cut marks, and I could only see the exterior. There was no inside as if it had been skinned off something, no openings at all no other bits of fur or bone, etc. on the snow to indicate it had been a coyote kill either. And suddenly I felt very uncomfortable. Like, what the hell went on here? I felt my brother skin animals in the past, so I know there have to be openings cut around the neck and legs, but the, but the skin can be pulled off in one piece. But this one didn't have any. It was one complete, flexible piece of fur. It was in the winter, so it should have been frozen stiff, but it was flexible like a live cat feels. I got totally creeped out, and I couldn't put it back fast enough, and my dog left it alone too. I thought about going to the house to get my camera, but frankly, I didn't want to go back to where this occurred. I didn't return to this spot all winter because the round track and fur thing was just too weird. 
and suddenly I didn't feel safe there. The magic was gone. Thanks again for all you do and stay safe. Kindest regards, Maureen. Maureen, that's a different one. And I'm a round chunk of hide. Like you, I couldn't understand your description. If, if you meant it was a round ball of fur, but you didn't say if there was a skinned raw hide on the backside of it. You just described it as a round ball of fur with no openings and malleable like a cat. So I, that's confusing to me. Like, I'm not sure you didn't feel any skeleton in the middle of it, no eyes, no head, no nothing. I'm just, I'm trying to picture. I think the description is like a round ball is in a basketball covered in fur, but no opening and no basketball in the middle. <laughs> if, if I read it right. But either way, anybody out in Alberta who's seen or experienced something similar, you know what to do. Get a hold of us. All right. This next one is titled Bigfoot Sighting While Elk Hunting. Steve, I really enjoy the platform that you provide to individuals who have had encounters with Bigfoot. You lend credibility and truth to the subject while showing no prejudice to others who come forward with their own experiences. You also seem like a stand-up guy who respects nature, the Native Americans, and people's freedoms. Keep doing what you do. Appreciate the kind words, man. And I will. This happened October 2004 while elk hunting in the White River National Forest in northwest Colorado. This area contains the largest migrating elk herd in North America. I'm not a resident of Colorado, but traveled to hunt the elk first in 2003. The outfitter refused to put me in a spike camp in the upper elevations, so instead I camped at the trailhead. So I got up for a dawn and hiked up the mountain looking for the elk herd. I was just... It was just too much, so I figured when I came back to hunt in 2004, I'd make my own camp high up to get closer to the elk herd, weather permitting. In 2004, I came back ready to hunt. I did an internet search and found an area of dark timber and open meadows and planned on hunting there. I hiked up, I hiked up the same trailhead as I did the year prior along the Ute Creek. The weather was warm and there was no snow in the high country yet. I hiked a good day back back before setting up my camp and I didn't see a soul the whole time. I packed light and was armed with a 300 Win Mag rifle. I had good optics and my GPS marked my route. As long as I kept the creek in my sight, I had an easy reference point back out so I wasn't worried about getting lost. I also carried a satellite phone since I wasn't, since I was alone, I wasn't taking any chances. The next day was a warm and sunny day, and I set out to locate this large meadow I'd seen on the internet map. I found it and entered above the northwest corner of the meadow. The tree line ended and slowly descended down into the open meadow. There were a few sparse trees and a rock outcropping as you left the tree line. I gauged the wind and it favored me, but as I descended lower, I could see that it swirled and at times was at my back. My game plan was to set up higher, possibly behind some rocks or trees, and hopefully the elk would come down the meadow towards me. I felt confident at a shot out to 250 yards. The 300 Win Mag is an accurate gun. That's why I carried one. I made my way back to camp and entered my way, mar sorry, and entered my way marks on the GPS so I could wake up early and get to the meadow before sunrise. I didn't make a fire, but I had a small cooking burner and ate some hot soup and was asleep very quickly. I woke up the next morning and was off to my spot. I arrived about 20 minutes before I, before sunrise, and it was very still with a slight breeze that I could tell was at my face. I sat up on top of some big rocks and used that as my bench rest. As the sun came out, I could make out the shape of elk in the middle of the meadow, about five or 600 yards away from me. The herd was mostly cows that I could see and numbered at least 100. I didn't count count but their herd was a good size that's huge to me for where i am hunt i slowly got my gear ready just in case the herd got closer i laid my rifle down alongside of me it was amazing to observe the elk in the wild as i scanned the herd i noticed how tight together they were and something occurred to me this herd wasn't grazing but they all seemed to be staring at one or two of the large cows the whole herd would shift its position as if on command from the lead cow. I scanned the edge around the meadow to see if I could locate any blaze orange. 
Could it be other hunters, I thought. I didn't see anything, but maybe they were well hidden too, but the wind wasn't in their favor. And then I thought a black bear or even a mountain lion may be stalking their herd. It was a good 100 to 200 yards from any cover to the edge of the elk, so whatever got the attention of the lead cow maybe was using the tree line as cover. I felt like I was in the middle of a really cool nature video, and I watched intently to what was happening. The lead cow would make small position changes, and the whole herd would move in unison, but staying mostly in the middle of the meadow. Every time the herd moved and stopped, the lead cow would stop and turn towards whatever she detected in the tree line. Then I thought maybe some big bulls were following the herd, but the rut was over. I kept glassing the whole time, looking for any sign of what was about to happen. And by this time, the sun had risen, and while there was still a nice chill in the air, it was warming, it was warming up. I wondered how long this herd would stay in the open. About 30 minutes. After about 30 minutes, something to my left caught my attention. About 200 yards away, I saw through my binoculars two very large dark shapes crawl out from the tree line towards a patch of three tall evergreen trees in front of me. What amazed me was the speed at which these two shapes moved. They covered the open ground and stopped at the trees as if they were crawling like army soldiers. They didn't seem to run on two legs or even four legs. They crawled with such efficiency and speed that it was hard to decipher what they could have been. They definitely weren't black bear as the size was too big. And do black bears hunt together? They didn't notice me as I still had the wind in my face. I had good cover and I didn't move. I had on camo except for my blaze orange vest and I had taken my orange hat off and put my warmer black stocking cap. I was in an elevated position. This allowed me to watch their every move. I observed these two things lift their heads up from a flat laying position in the grass and peek towards the herd of elk. I got momentary glimpses of them as they did this. My mind couldn't process what I was seeing. What were they? I kept thinking to myself. I shifted my binoculars towards the elk herd, which was still making small position changes while concentrating on something on the opposite side of the meadow from me. Whatever was there, I couldn't see it. After an hour of no movement, the elk herd started to spread out a little. With the exception of the lead cow, she stood up, she stood and watched the tree line. She'd dip her head and wag her tail. Her ears were up the whole time, keeping on alert. Wag her tail. They don't got tails. Whatever I saw earlier, I think, was still over by the three trees laying low, but I didn't see them. I wanted to bring my rifle up and try to zoom in on this with the scope, but I feared moving. And just as I thought about finally doing so, I heard a couple of chirps like birds make. Then I heard another chirping sound from the area where I saw these two things. That made one of these things get up and move parallel to the elk herd. Once again, this thing moved with such great speed and efficiency. It didn't crawl, but this time ran in a squatted position. Ran in a squatted position. That's been reported a few times. It took up position about 100 yards away from the other one, and I lost sight of it. It now was above the elk herd, while the other one was below it. I then started to figure out that whatever was on the other side of the meadow was trying to drive the the herd towards my side. Again, I heard what sounded like birds chirping, and I waited for some sort of movement. I figured that the next movement I detected, I would try to grab my rifle, which was behind me. My heart was pounding so hard, I'm surprised you didn't hear it. I wasn't afraid of what I saw, but I was afraid of being detected. I just couldn't process what I was witnessing, and I thought because of my inexperience hunting in the West, I didn't know what I was seeing. I shifted my focus towards the herd, which was still slowly moving around. Again, more chirping. Sounds came from across the meadow from me. This caused the lead cow elk to switch her position to the opposite side of the herd that she was on. Just then, I saw all of the elk look over to the side of the meadow, and then they all took off, running first towards the side of the meadow I was on, and then, as if directed by the lead cow, they took off straight up the meadow away from me. The whole time, they didn't get close to the edge of the meadow. 
I quickly reached down, grabbed my rifle, shouldered it, and scanned the area for movement from the two that I saw. Again, I heard the chirping sounds. The one closest to me slowly rose up, using the trees as cover. It was on two feet, bent over at the waist, peeking out between the tree branches. I had my rifle scope on this thing and increased the power, and I could definitely see it was no bear. It was no man. It was at least eight to nine feet tall, and it had to weigh 800 pounds. Its shoulders and back were wide and covered with matted hair. I would describe it as a buffalo standing on two feet minus the horns. It was black in color with a large head. Compared to the other one, it appeared to be larger in size. I never, It never turned towards me as it was fixated on the elk. I scanned up and down looking at this thing through my rifle scope. The longer I looked, the calmer I became. I even thought how calm I was if, if I wanted to shoot this thing, I'd have no problem holding my rifle steady. Plus, I was laying on rocks in my pack as a rest for my rifle. But then I thought I was using 225 grain, grain bullets. Sorry, but then I thought I was using 225 grain bullets. Would that be enough to stop this thing? Regardless, there was no way I would have ever taken a shot, and I'm proud to say that. My next thought was to try and get to my camera, which is in my pack. I switched my attention to see what the elk herd was doing, and they had stopped and were again in, the, in a tight bunch. They all were looking at the edge of the meadow opposite of me. They started to slowly move towards me, and then the lead elk turned them in a big J pattern. I rotated back and forth watching the elk move and the Bigfoot ahead of me, he was still as a statue. I watched them for quite a while. The elk kept making the same J pattern. They would stop and then all together trot about 30 to 50 yards and then turn and curl in or out like the letter J. Every so often I would hear the chirping sounds, but nothing other than the elk making their same movements. It's like they were deceiving the Bigfoot who were trying to pattern their movements. Whatever they were doing, it seemed to work. These elk had no desire to enter the woods, but they didn't leave the meadow. What if they got closer to me for a shot, I thought? Would I expose my position to them if I did, and how would they react? I heard about grizzly bears coming to the sound of gunshots. Would, they, would, they, would, they, sorry, would these things do the same? It was now going on 11 a.m. in the morning. It was still chilly, maybe in the 40s. I figured the elk would have wanted to move into the dark timber, but they stayed in the middle of the meadow. The Bigfoot ahead of me had lowered himself back down, as was now, and was now laying alongside the clump of trees. I started to feel a small chill in the back of my neck, and I was thinking the wind was changing slightly. You could see clouds off in the distance, and the weather had called for snow. This whole time, I never thought about food, water, or even trying to take a piss. I was so locked in on what I was seeing, and time seemed to fly by. I still wanted to get my camera, but I didn't want to risk moving. Finally, I slowly set my rifle down next to me and slid my pack out. And just then I heard the whistling, but this time in rapid, rapid succession and from more than one position. I think I was busted. I froze and I saw the Bigfoot ahead of me get up and turn heading, to, heading towards the tree line and returned to my direction, and once again it moved without sound and incredibly fast, as if it were floating on air. I cannot emphasize enough the speed at which these things moved. Then it was gone into the timber. I got my camera up, and never again did I see one. I also noticed after about 15 minutes, the elk were in a more re of a relaxed state. Some were lying down, others were grazing. The lead cow would occasionally look around, but even she seemed more relaxed. They eventually came down towards me, heading to the creek to drink. They moved very quickly and were out of sight as they followed the creek down. It was now about 2 p.m. and I slowly got down from the rocks and sat there trying to gather my thoughts. I was phys physically and mentally exhausted. I fell asleep for about 30 minutes, but woke and felt fear as I thought, how am I going to get back to my tent? I had to walk through the timber. Would these things be waiting for me? I finally got up and glassed the whole area looking for any signs of what I saw. I made it very slowly back to my tent. I gathered my things up and moved my camp down alongside the creek. I made a small fire and ate, staying on alert. 
during the night it started snowing but it didn't get that cold the next day it got into the 70s melting the snow and it made for a muddy mess with the warmer weather i figured the elk would stay up in the high country as i found no sign of them i eventually made it back to the trailhead i called a man who i arranged to pack my elk out if i got one and he grew up in this area and he was very knowledgeable of the high country and i asked him excuse me kind of jokingly what is the strangest thing you've ever seen in the woods and he laughed and he said that he's heard stories but never saw anything i told him what i saw and he believed me he asked if i sure it wasn't a bear and i wished i would have called him right away i told him i had this thing in my sights and i know what i saw i was hesitant to tell anyone this story not even my wife i eventually told my son and he has always encouraged me to talk to others about it but with my job i didn't think i should I got some full-on sky reflection behind me on the screen. It's making me really a little awkward, you guys. I'm sorry. And I've gone back and hunted that area in Colorado during archery season with a guide. And during our hunt, during the rut, I heard that bird chirping sounds. And although it was probably birds this time, you never know. I asked my guide about Bigfoot, and he said he's heard stories too, but nothing sighted around here. We talked about the vastness of the forest and the availability of food to survive if these things did exist and how easy it would be for them to do so. Not too many people have gone into this area. I'm interested in hearing your opinion, your experience with bear and hunting big game is far greater than mine. I'm from the Midwest and I've never heard or seen anything like this around where I hunt. I am forever haunted by what occurred on that day, but I've learned to live with it. It doesn't go by that I don't think about it, and I feel extremely lucky to have witnessed my sighting. I've seen people on TV who say, we need to kill a Bigfoot. These people are idiots. If Bigfoot proves to exist, it would be one of the greatest scientific finds of this century, and the last. Yet people would shoot one? We should listen to the Native Americans and show Bigfoot respect. Thanks, Steve. I do wish to remain anonymous, and that you will, my friend, no problem. And I've read this, I'm pretty certain I've read this before, and it would have been a long time ago. And that's one hell of a sighting. You imagine? You imagine. I mean, I've had, I don't know how many elk hunters have mailed in. Lots, right? A lot of elk hunters have mailed in. But that right there, the scene, that scene. <laughs> that would be something else, man. Something else. Okay, here's another one. These are kind of older ones, I think. This is titled Second Time. Steve, here's our second experience looking for the critters. Uh oh. Me and my two oldest sons take our snowmobiles up to where we found and had the experience of the animal screaming at us. Nothing at all in the snow, just a squirrel chattering and a tree leaning against, leaning against another, sounding like knocking. Nothing. We ride a lot of snowmobiles for fun, usually in the higher elevation. We wait until we wait until summer to take the motorcycles back up to the area. This time armed with two 454s and a 460 Magnum. <laughs> My number two heads into a different trail and we follow him. He's already off his bike and helmet off and gun pointing down at the ground out of its holster. He says there's something up the hill. It's about 10 in the morning, daylight and calm. We get in a row about 10 feet apart and slowly start the climb with our guns at our sides. Me, my number two, then my oldest. The shrubs were one to two and a half feet tall. Game trails crisscrossing as we slowly walked up the hill. And then something starts parting the bushes about five feet in front of my number two. We can see the ground and the bush is parting as it's running away from us. Now all our guns are pointing towards the movement. And as it runs up the hill, about 20 feet in front, there's some 12 inch trees leaning against a limb of a live tree, about eight to 10 of them and 25 feet tall. And they're the same shape. They're in the same shape of a partial teepee. As I watch one of the leaning as I watch, there's some punctuations out here. As I watch, one of the leaning trees starts to vibrate as if something is climbing it, again invisible to our eyes. This happens for a short time. Tree breaks about five feet from the top. We hear something hit the ground with a loud thud and the sound of this thing running off. 
This was clear forest dirt where it hit. Next, the top of the tree hits the ground in front. The bottom half hits the ground. We continue up the hill. The gun's now pointing down. I taught the boys never shoot at a sound, always know your target and beyond. I walked where the tree is now on the ground and under the teepee. I went about 10 feet in the direction where I heard it run off to, and I could hear what sounded like talking just out in the distance. Again, no one was there. I could see clearly where this thing ran to. My oldest called me to him and said, look at this. What he found was on a log with evenly spaced a, a twig crossways, then pine cone pointing down the log, twig, pine cone, all spaced evenly, about six in a row, all in the same configuration. No squirrel does that. The area was well used and bare forest ground. Next, as we're looking around, I see aspens in an open area, and they are maybe 50 feet tall with no branches on them, up to about 40. Then the had limbs. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. I'm reading what's typed out. These had no other trees other than the two like this in the open. My aspens in the open have limbs and are bushy all the way to the top. I think this is for the young to climb and hide if danger comes by, same as bears do. It wasn't natural. Next, we find a rock circle about 20 feet in diameter. Rock stacked about 3 feet high and the area also. I don't know what made this. It could have been humans because we saw old beer cans on the way down the hill. I said this before. What we witnessed was something with mass, but able to cloak itself invisible. My background is laboratory electronics, and I think that these creatures don't go dimensional, but have the ability to vibrate a frequency where it is not visible to our eyes, similar to when an animal shakes when it's scared. When this thing ran, we held still and quiet, and we could see the movement, hear it, but it was not visible to our eyes. My other opinion is we ran into a Bigfoot nursery where they were raising their young. I have more experiences that I will share later. Bob Grand Junction, Colorado. All right, man. I hope it, it might have been me butchering that reading. I don't know. Maybe it's the email. I don't know. But there you go. Share it. Sounds odd. Sounds like an odd one. I don't know what you guys are doing. You guys out there trying to kill one of these people? I don't know. A little confused in that reading. I switched my background to light from dark to hopefully to hopefully uh, help me read it smoother. Let me get one. All right, my battery's dying, so I saved a couple paragraphs here of introduction, I think. Oh, no, I didn't. Hold on. As you can see, this was sent over a year ago, but I have an addition from this year. We believe, and no one can tell us anything different. Thanks for giving those of us an avenue to share our experiences without being shamed. I'm a 67-year-old woman and have no reason to lie about what I and my partner Greg have experienced since we moved to the Black Hills of South Dakota. First, I need to explain, we do not live in the forest, but off the interstate on six acres. There's a subdivision right across the road and a hill behind us, the hill behind us is residential. We can look out our front door over an industrial park between us and the interstate. The other side of the interstate, past some residential areas, starts the Black Hills. My first experience was in 2013. I was going in early to work and stopped at the end of the driveway to look for traffic. When I looked across the road and up a street leading to the homes on the hill, there was something standing by a tree next to the road. A large object standing next to a tree. It looked like a bear standing up on two legs with its arms outstretched, but the shape wasn't a bear. I didn't have the sense to grab my phone, but I did stare at it for about three minutes. I looked down to check the time, and when I looked back up, I could see its back going up the hill and disappear. When I came home that night, I drove up to where I saw the creature and realized just how big it was. When I pulled my car next to the tree it was standing by, and would never have been able to reach the branches where the head was without a stepladder, and standing on the top step, I'm 5'6". I've been meaning to take a picture of the tree and the area where the figure was standing. Then having Greg stand in the position where I saw the creature, 
Greg 6 too, so that would give me a better perspective of the size of the creature. It was big. A few months later, we had a snow in April. I was going to the garage to get my car, and I noticed some footprints in the snow by the garage. No shoes. That means barefoot. The size was a little bigger than my size 10. There was no arc like a human foot, so it was like a flat, broad foot, almost the same size all the way. But there were toes imprinted. I called Greg out of the house, and we took pictures. If it was what we thought, if it was what we thought, it was f footprints of a Sasquatch. We're thinking it was a juvenile from everything we have learned. We did have some friends come visit us the next day, and of course, we're anxious to show them the footprints. The temperature was cold enough, the snow had melted, and as usual, as usual, they laughed and made jokes, but the husband did say, not in earshot of his wife, that he had no idea what the prints were from. We had already gone online and had had printout of all the animals we know that roam this area. And about a month later, May, we're sitting in the living room about 10 p.m., and it was dark and we were watching TV, when all of a sudden we heard this very, very loud sound outside. Greg describes it as the sound of the wind blowing a stretched cable. Nothing like that around here. Even, everything's underground. I searched the internet and found the recording by an officer of the law in the South Dakota Badlands not far from us. It's the closest I could come. I can say the head stood up in my arms and I started shaking. Greg got up to his, got up to get his gun, but I asked him not to go outside. In all reality, it shook us both up. We've not had any experiences since. Our theory is that they were migrating, and because there really isn't anywhere... Sorry, and because there really isn't anywhere is in this area for food or water that they just keep on moving. Okay, so I think you meant there isn't any food or, or water around there, so they just kept on going. Needless to say, we are very aware of our surroundings. We don't have any problem telling people our story, whether they believe it or not is their problem. And thank you for allowing us to share. We would encourage others to do so. They are there. And someday the truth will come out. This summer 2020, I was coming down the driveway and looked up the hill with the road with a road that leads to a subdivision above us. And it was midday, so shadows wouldn't be. And I saw something big over by a road sign. At first, I thought it was a big dog. But then looking at it more closely, I realized it was something bent over. I was getting close to the house and parked my car. When I got out of the car and looked up at the spot again, it was gone. The majority of the stories we hear about these beings <clears throat> take place <clears throat> excuse me, in non-populated areas. But it seems there's something special about this area. Ruth Jones and Greg Tanner. You have permission to use our names. And there you go, and I appreciate your honesty. I absolutely appreciate your honesty and the time you just took out of your life to email us with what you saw, what you know you saw. And there you go. Four members of the Club of No Return, meaning once you know, you know. Right? Once you know, you know. Ooh, this is a book. That one's a book. Oh, it's a short one. Okay, I'm going to read this one more. I'm going to start hiking. i got a ways to go here. Down the river. And it's all freaking 10 foot thick willow this way. It's nasty where I've got myself, but whatever. Hey, Steve. Thank you for being a no BS kind of guy. My sixth sense. My sixth sense. Since. <laughs> got jump started when I was five. And me and my dad were hunting deer. And the night before we had helped to a Texas hunter haul his deer from the river. We do a different kind of hunting. It's not really hunting, but we just sit in a truck and wait for the deer to come. So, we had blood in the back of our pickup. We run cows where we hunt. Well, if I look in the mirror, and there's a mountain lion sniffing the tailgate, but that's where my sixth sense really got started. So, when I saw it, 
I was hunting and I just had my 17 HMR and I was walking looking for rabbits and I hadn't seen anything and I spooked one up so I tried to get it. I went over the edge of the canyon and I saw the trees moving on the other side of the canyon like something was hitting them. So I laid down and looked through my scope. There's a five acre pond on our land so I was looking at it. I didn't know what it was but I was watching and then this man-like figure walked out of the trees holding its right arm and it looked like it was about to fall over and it was a smoky color. Its right arm was matted red color and it walked down to the edge of the water and fell in and rubbed its arm in the muddy water and it turned a red color. Then looked up at me and got up and walked into this swamp and just dispersed. Probably meant disappeared. Thank you again, sincerely, Billy Greer. Holy shit, Billy. You still hanging out with us? And you've had any follow-up of that? Email, I guess, email us again. That's the first time ever I heard of somebody saying that they saw one of these things wounded, washing an arm or whatever in the water and blood coming off of them. What a crazy ass sighting that is. And I wonder if you've learned anything since then, seen anything else, or talked to anybody who has seen something or shot at one of these things. That would be really interesting to hear. We've, I don't, we've heard, one time we heard of a guy emailed in for, and he was out fishing on his boat, trout fishing on Chilliwack Lake and saw this thing with its arm, one arm was hanging limp by its side, like it was useless, hurt, whatever. That's the only one that comes to mind of one being actually wounded. Crazy. Okay, one more, then I'm going to go. <laughs> Crazy. Hello, Steve. My name is Russ, and I live in the northern part of Minnesota. I'd like to thank you for all that you're doing for us that have had the unfortunate experience of seeing these beings and had the shit scared out of us. I actually emailed you before. I actually emailed you before about my first sighting. I believe it was back in March. Since my first encounter in 2012, I've had a couple of other sightings in the same general area that I hunt. Tree knocks. Found a few tracks heard their moan, howl call that makes you want to shit yourself and jump out of your own skin, and I heard two of them having what sounded like a conversation. Although it sounded like gibberish, it was definitely a conversation. The activity always seems to pick up around late September through October, and then again in December, as I'm very certain they know what rifle season is in November, and I believe they hide out in the bogs. I still get an uneasy feeling walking into my stand in the dark during bow season due to the leaves still being on the trees, and our woods are very thick. Not quite as bad as during rifle season. I want to email you again and let you know something that has helped me reduce my fear and possibly to help others that don't want their love for the outdoors to be ruined. I have spoken to a few of the Ojibwe elders in my community about encounters, and they both told me the same thing. These beings are the masters of the woods and are always aware of your presence. They can sense if you are good or bad. If they wanted to hurt you, you don't stand a chance of making it out of the woods alive, even with a rifle. They're always watching. And I say they because there is usually more than one. I asked them how I could get over my fear and enjoy my love of hunting. And one elder told me to learn how to say hello to the woods, to the people of the woods. I'm your friend in the Ojibwe language. I started doing it this season and I say it out loud as I'm walking into my stand or after I get up in it. The activity has seemed to reduce. I still get the occasional tree knock or a branch snapping, but for the most part, they haven't scared the shit out of me like they used to. I swear they have a sense of humor and find it funny. I honestly don't know what it is, what is working, or maybe they just realize that I mean no harm and just and I just want to hunt. Either way, I thought this may be helpful to others and keep up the good work and as always be safe. You may use my name if you share this as I don't give two shits about what other people think. I know what I've seen, heard, and smelled in the woods and nothing will ever change my mind. Thanks for reading, Russell Trettel. T-R-E-T-T-E-L, Russell. Appreciate you sending that in, man. I'm sure you helped somebody. I'll guarantee you, if you haven't helped if that didn't help somebody instantly, then they're going to look into it and they're going to try it out. 
because I know there's a lot of people that are scared shitless to go in the woods. And they still want to, right? Anyway. I better get my ass moving. Gotta go buy some new waders. Damn it. I shredded these suckers open just below my knee. Oh well. Oh, gotta go home. Get some more stuff done. Get some appointments made. Get the uh, first video with the ladies edited and loaded. That's what I'm gonna do. Get my ass out of here without falling down the bank. <laughs> I'll be back shortly, you guys. Share my story at howtohunt.com. All right? You got something that you need to get off your chest. There's something that's going to help somebody, yourself, or help me. Email me. Please email me. Share my story at howtohunt.com. I'll be back. I might even run this battery out. I can, for the hell of it. Oh, maybe use it for some. Whoops. B-roll or something. In a video, possibly. Oh man. All right, here we go. Look at the size of <clears throat> used to be a stump. It's pretty big. here one day and <clears throat> get these out coming down this bank that is one hell of a elk crossing there holy Yeah, there's the truck. <clears throat> 
perfect. <clears throat> God, this shit sucks. I'm going around. I know better. Man, there's elk crap everywhere in here. Now, yeah. gotta bust through this shit to get to the truck somehow. This isn't the way I came in. Well, here we go. So I'm just nose my way into it. Challenging bushes with a fishing rod. <laughs> this stuff. Oh, there's an elk tunnel through it. Perfect. There we go. Oh shit. Made it out of the woods again without getting without getting abducted. Again. <laughs> Sarah doesn't think that shit's funny. I do. <laughs> there we go.